So welcome back, everyone. Is this thing on? Anyway, um, yeah, so welcome back. Uh, and uh, we have our last panel this morning, um, the title of which is 20th Century Constructions of the Past. And, uh, and our, our first speaker is Matthew King from UC Riverside, speaking on the Fogoji in translation. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Jake and Caberly and all the organizers, uh, and also for the other presenters for the uh, incredible papers yesterday. Um, so, um, over the last few days, uh, we've heard quite a bit about the impact of Buddhism on Mongolian societies, about the ways that Buddhism did or did not change the quotidian realities of Mongolian peoples, to use Johann Elverskog's wording from the keynote. Uh, that opened this conference. And together we've questioned the utility of some of the enduring categories that organized the study of inner Asian religion and have reflected on whether out of fashion representations like la uh, Lamaism or Lama Zhou um, and shamanism ought to be given new life. More generally, we focused on processes of circulation, mediation, and localization, the way that law, ritual, models of history, material culture, uh, political ideologies and institutional forms moved in and out of Mongolian societies in zones of contact with Tibetan, Chinese, and Russian spheres of influence. Um, my presentation this morning explores a still more dispersed circuit of exchange, one that reaches geographically deep into Western Europe, implicates the earliest expressions of an academic study of the Mongolian uh, and Tibetan world, and which opens the late imperial, uh, sorry, and which spans the late imperial period, the revolutionary transition in Halkh and the global Tibetan diaspora today. Um, this was, this all sort of centers on the translation of the fifth century pilgrimage record of the Chinese monk Fasian into Mongolian, Mongolian and Tibetan, and the variety of competing social and religious imagining it helped engender during the imperial socialist transition. So the life and literary traces of the famous Chinese monk Fasian uh, will already be familiar to most of you. I'm sure most of you teach it uh, and, and know it uh, uh, very well. So here I'll just offer a very brief review of his fantastic life and the record of it, of it which he left. According to the traditional accounts, at the close of the fourth century, Fasian was a 62-year-old monk despairing at the state of Buddhist tradition in the Eastern Jin Din, uh, Dynasty. The Vinaya and Sutras existed only in partial tra uh, Chinese translation. Monastic institutionalism more generally was poorly and unevenly organized. Resolving to remedy that story state of affairs in 399 uh, of the Common Era, Fasian set off from Chang'an with a few companions for what would be a 14-year odyssey through major sites of Buddhist learning and pilgrimage in Central and South Asia. Traveling along the danger, dangerous overland route to India, Fasian visited and carefully documented many of the thriving Buddhist city-states of what we now call the Silk Road, as you guys all know. Eventually reaching the great seats of Buddhist learning in India, Fasian spent several years studying Sanskrit and making hand copies of canonical texts uh, like the Mahasamgaka uh, Vinaya and the Mahaparinirvana uh, Sutra, among many others. He then journeyed from a port in Bengal to Ceylon, Java, and Sumatra before taking the sea route home to China in 413. And there, together with the Indian monk Buddha Bhadra in Chang'an, for the remainder of his life, Fasian translated many texts in, uh, um, that have been preserved in various iterations of the Chinese canon to today. Important though those early translations were to building a more complete Chinese Buddhist canon, Fasian is perhaps most widely remembered for the detailed account he wrote of that long journey through Buddhist Central and South Asia. The version that survives is known to us as Fashan's record, Fashan Zhuan, uh, or known more commonly as the record of Buddhistic kingdoms as it's often translated, the Fu uh, Foguo uh, Zhe. Fashan's record is the earliest and most comprehensive eyewitness description of the networks of Buddhist city-states that dotted trade routes in Central Asia. Uh, and he was a careful observer of both the location, histories, uh, and practices performed at pilgrimage centers in India 
uh, in the organizational structures of the many monasteries he visited and so on. More than simply a description of a physical journey through the mosaic of Buddhist societies at the turn of the fifth century, Fashan's record is also a grand statement about the continuities and unified territories of the Buddhist dispensation, one that included China as a borderland on the fringes of long established Central and South Asian Buddhist societies. Um, and for this reason, Fashan's account became a template for, uh, for many other pilgrimage accounts that were to follow. And we all know this, Xuanzang, Yijing, so on and so forth, um, who write in the centuries that follow after their travels to, to, to Buddhist India. Um, in the centuries after Fashan's death, his records circulated widely in East Asia, coming to be known as uh, Hokenden in Japanese and uh, Pyopyon Chun in Korean. But there's another, much later, an unstudied chapter in the circuit of the record that comes some 15 centuries later uh, after Fashan bravely set out from Chang'an. And this was, as I mentioned uh, already, uh, uh, beginning in the middle of the 19th century, the translation of this classic of East Asian Buddhism into Mongolian and then a couple decades later into Tibetan. Inner Asian readers made immediate use of this record of antiquarian trans-Asian Buddhist and cultural uh, life, precisely at a time when new social imaginaries, collective historicizations, and Buddhist reformulations were occurring along the complex Mongolian and Tibetan frontiers of the Russian, Qing, and British empires. The story gets more interesting, though, because Fashian's record did not enter Inner Asia via the Chinese, as many presume, but through a fascinating trans-Eurasian circuit that begins not in Beijing, Hure, or Wutaishan, but in Paris, during the founding moments of French Sinology and the formalization of the academic study of Asia and its religious traditions. It starts with the remarkable scholar uh, Jean-Pierre uh, abel ray Moussat. There he is. Um, abel ray Moussat was an influential French sinologist whose works were some of the earliest to bring Western European audiences into contact with the cultural heritage of East, South, and uh, Inner Asia. First trained as a physician, he earned his medical degree in 1813 uh, um, but as a medical student, he spent five years teaching himself Chinese in order to read a guide to medicinal plants that he discovered. By the time he became a, a doctor, the, by the time he earned his medical degree, the young physician had already published several works on Chinese grammar and literature, including a Latin study of Chinese characters. So well received were these publications that in 1814, when he was only 26 years old, Abel Moussat was appointed to hold the newly established chair in Chinese uh, studies at the Collège uh, de France, the first academic post in Sinology in the Western world. And while at the Collège, uh, and later as a member of the Académie des uh, Inscriptions et Belles Lettres, and um, uh, editors and uh, uh, curators and so on of various collections of Oriental manuscripts uh, around Paris, Albert Rémoussat pioneered Sinology as an academic field of inquiry. So in recent decades, scholars contributing to the so-called New Qing history and other revisionist turns in the study of late imperial Chinese history uh, have discovered the value of Manchu sources and have understood that Qing as an imperial formation made along its frontiers. Uh, but as Mark Elliott recently noted on the 200th anniversary of Abel Remusat's uh, posting, or maybe his death, uh, uh, this turn to inner Asian sources on Chinese history is really only a rediscovery. Already two centuries ago, Abel Moussat pursued a course of sinological research that balanced Chinese with Tibetan, Mongolian, Uyghur, and Manchu sources. And indeed, his chair at the Collège de France was not in sinology as such, but in Chinese and Tartar Man Manchu. Um, Abel Moussat's works were some of the first to bring European audiences into direct contact with translations of Chinese, Japanese, Mongolian, Tibetan, Sanskrit, and Pali texts. These monoliths of Oriental scholarship in the 18, uh, 1830s really opened a new era of European uh, direct access to Asian cultural artifacts and translation. And Buddhism was a particular theme in his research. His explorations um, on this topic were as eclectic as in the rest of his scholarly pursuits. He wrote, for example, on the hagiographies of the 33 Buddhist patriarchs, uh, you know, uh, wrote on the epithets of the Buddha and so on. And very interestingly, he also published a specul speculative piece on the origins of the Tibetan and Mongolian Lamaist hierarchy, as he says. It's a really interesting uh, article. 
whose forms and guiding cosmologies he's de he determined were surely due to there being, quote, a kind of degenerate Christianity, end quote. While Abel Remusat's scholarship was widely read in his time, one of his works in particular has really endured, and that, of course, is his translation of the Fo Guo Zhe, of Fa Xian's record. Fo Guo Zhe. Ji. <laughs> Fa Xian's record. Quote, for the European view of the life of the Buddha, writes Donald Lopez, this was the first concerted attempt to identify the places in the Buddha's biography with actual locations in India. Abel Remusat's work represents the most detailed life of the Buddha to appear in Europe up to that time, end quote. And sadly, this pioneering sinologist died in the cholera uh, epidemic that beset Paris in 1832 when his translation was only uh, half done. Um, happily, though, it was completed by colleagues and published in 1836, with many, many, many other English um, translations, especially uh, coming well into the uh, late 19th century. Now, Abel Remusat's work is actually best thought of less as a translation as such and more as a compendium of contemporary European knowledge about Asia and Buddhism. Fashian's text takes up only about 50 pages in his translation, which altogether is over 500 pages long. The excess is filled with notations that provide a master narrative to the Buddhist worlds and to the Buddhist biography through which Fashian journeyed. And it is here finally with this complex product of the earliest academic focus, uh, sorry, the earliest academic um, studies in Europe on Asia and Buddhism, that we come to the fascinating but mostly unstudied circuit of Fashian's record into Mongolian and Tibetan. Uh, and to do this, we need to come to a fascinating figure, not only in the intellectual history of Buryatia, but also in the Asian circuit of humanist and social scientific methods into Asia's heartland, which is uh, Dorje Banzarov. Banzarov was born into a family of peasant Buryat Cossacks in March of 1822 in Transbaikal uh, Oblast. He excelled in his early studies, and like another early Buryat modernist, the monk uh, uh, Gombeyev, Banzarov trained at the gymnasium in Kazan, which Robert Rupin once called, quote, uh, the cultural as well as the political forefront of Russia in Asia and an important center of Orientalist studies, end quote. Uh, at Kazan, he studied Latin, French, English, Turkish, and Russian, alongside mathematics, geography, and, uh, and so on. Defining himself in his studies, in 19, uh, 1847, Banzarov produced a dissertation at Kazan that has come up already in this conference entitled The Black Faith, or Shamanism Among the Mongols, the first ever scholarly study on this, uh, on this subject in any language. Banzarov then moved to St. Petersburg, uh, where he did scientific research at the Asiatic Museum. Um, before serving sort of imperial functions in eastern Siberia until his death in 1855. Like Abel Remusat, Banzarov was a pioneer who helped solidify certain problematic and enduring biases in the study of inter-Asian religions, um, as I said, that have come up already. So Chris Atwood charges Banzarov's black faith, for example, for helping to cast a problematic mold in the study of Mongolian religions by being laden with what he calls dubious first principles such as that a foreign Lamaism rooted in Tibet could mask but never erase enduring shamanist sensibilities that were somehow inextricable from the Mongolian and Buryat character. So this so-called two-tier model invented by Banzarov is still quite alive and well, as we heard yesterday from Professor Charlot and also as Johan mentioned in his keynote. Um, So there's much to talk about with Banzarov, uh, and in the longer version of this research, I explore the ways that his scholarship opened pathways for the progressive Buryats who would come later and help invent the Mongolian national subject, uh, figures like Varadin, Jamsurano, and even Agvan Georgiev, um, who, and who would later help lead and kind of provide the, uh, almost become the, po the poets of the revolutions, uh, and who were great Buddhist reformers who sought to create uh, a modernist version of the tradition that would be amenable to, the social, uh, to a socialist modernity. But what's relevant to uh, this discussion this morning is that it was Banzarov who first brought Fashan's record into Inner Asia, completing a Mongolian translation of, of Abel Remusat's work in the mid-19th century. Banzarov's work is remark uh, remarkably filial to Abel Remusat's translation, um, following the French sinologist's narrative to the word, 
with hardly any kind of introduction, annotation, clarification, uh, or addendum, and so on. In this, sen in this sense, Benzeroff's translation of Faustian's record is of a kind with the later English translations of Beale uh, and Lege, who remained very faithful to the original French translation, um, which was, we remember, itself this excessive compendium of European knowledge on the topic. Now, if this were the end of the story, uh, that the journey of Fashan's record into Inner Asia remained simply a curiosity of European-Mongolian exchange in the late and post-imperium, and that it existed alongside other early translation of European arts and sciences uh, as diverse as Robinson Crusoe and the uh, studies of Gustav John Ramstead and so on, uh, then I, I probably would have wasted your time this morning. But as it turns out, Banzarov's rather sober translation of Abel Remusat's French version of Fashan's record was the basis for one final, far more radical and influential translation into Tibetan in the hands of that prominent and prolific Helhaman, uh, monastic scholar of the revolutionary era, Zawa Damdin. Unlike Banzarov, whose authorial voice is hardly anywhere in his Mongolian translation, Zawa Damdin regularly intervenes in his version uh, of the record, which he completed in 1918. After long praises to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, for example, he contextualizes this project as follows. Quote, there exists a Chinese language biography of uh, one such great being who journeyed to the land of the noble ones. Having found that Chinese account, a European foreigner translated it into his own language. The meaning of what was described in that text helped to verify the authentic research already undertaken on India. A Buryat Lama Lotsawa translated that, uh, that European translation into Mongolian. The present work is a translation of that Mongolian translation into Tibetan." End quote. So despite such reassur reassurances, Zawa Damdin's translation is in fact hardly a bare translation. Like Abel Remusat, in fact, who heavily supplemented the original Chinese text with expansive notations that were essentially an argument for the field of Sinology and uh, Orientalist scholarship in general, Zawa Damdin's Tibetan translation is better thought of as a compendium of scholastic knowledge about India after centuries of cosmopolitan Gelug scholasticism along the Sino, Tibetan, and Mongolian frontiers. Zawa Damdin's primary sources that he uses to clarify and enliven Fashan's record are Gombo Jab's uh, 18th century tra Tibetan translation of Xuanzang's guidebook, uh, the Oxhorn Sutra, the Langrunung Tempa, uh, various Qing era uh, geographies, and of course also the root tantra of Manju Shri, uh, which factors in so prominently in his work. Um, interestingly, and as part of what I have argued elsewhere, was an important uh, turn to evidence-based histori historiography amongst these frontier Gelug scholastics over the Qing. Zawa Damdin also heavily supplements Banzarov's Mongolian uh, version with the oral record, with oral interviews, oral reports, and so on. Um, that he had heard from travelers to Central Asia and India, including some European scholars who he writes showed him pictures and maps of Silk Road excavations. So I don't know who exactly these, these were, he doesn't specify, um, but it all helps supplement his interpretation. So, and I don't have any time to really go into detail about each of Zawa Damdin's hundreds of interventions into Fashan's record, but let me just close by showing you one example, a really uh, pulled at random, of the sort of layering of narrative and intervention that colors this work. Um, I'll leave that. Uh, so I mean, this is just, a, just really just the opening of one of dozens and dozens of chapters, where in the blue is the narrative, Abel Ramusat's narrative, as translated by Banzarov. In red is the supplement from Schwanzang's guidebook. In green is Zawa Damdin's own authorial voice intervening. And then back to uh, Banzarov's version. And it just goes on and on and on. We're switching to the Kala Chakra, to the Jampal Tsagyu, the Manjushri, the Rutantra Manjushri, and so on and so on. It's just this beautiful, expansive, expansive kind of stuffed text um, that goes on and on and on. And uh, yeah, um, which I'm a little enthusiastic about, as you can see. Um, beyond stuffing Banzarov's translation full of textual sources on Indian Buddhism, elsewhere in Zawa Damdin's oeuvre, he uses the new historical information gleaned from Fashan's record to tell radical new stories about the history of Mongolian Buddhism 
in relationship to its Chinese and Tibetan neighbors. And it's important to note this because it's Zawa Damdan's Tibetan version that for the last hundred years has circulated in Tibetan communities. So there are, uh, if you read any um, kind of uh, histories of Buddhism, Chujung texts written by Tibetan scholars in exile or even in the PRC and so on, it's this version of Fashan's text that they cite. And also Zawa Damdan's interpretation of Mongol history on the basis of Fashan um, that uh, guides their own interpretations. The most pronounced uh, application of Fashan's, of this new historical information from Fashan and Zhao Damdan's work is to the Golden Book, which many of you are familiar with, the Altan Defter or the Serki Defter, uh, which he completed in 1931, just before the purges, but whose early, very innovative chapters on the ancient history of Mongolian peoples he completed in 1919. Uh, and so I'll use just the remaining few minutes that I have to very briefly summarize the very new conclusions about the Mongolian Buddhist past that Fashan's record uh, afforded him. So it's quite well known that Gombojab's 18th century translation of Xuanzang's pilgrimage tale was often used by later Mongolian historians like Rashi Punsok uh, to ar argue that not only had Mongols received the Dharma earlier than the Chinese, but that Mongol peoples had supplied the Han with their first Buddhist statue during the reign of Wudi, uh, who sent military forces into uh, Shunu, uh, Shungnu territory, which were being claimed as Mongol uh, uh, forever after. So similarly, in the early 20th century, and on the basis of Fashian's record, now in Tibetan, Zawa Damdan found evidence that not only had Mongols received the Dharma before the, the Tibetans, but that it was Mongols who were instrumental in bringing the Dharma to the imperial courts of the Tibetan Empire, beginning in the 6th century. Basically, this move is justified by a creative philology on the part of Zawa Damdan that had already become standard scholastic practice over the course of the Qing, to claim the sundry, very messy, and incomplete references to northerly nomadic peoples um, in Indic and Central Asian Chinese historical sources um, as Mongol peoples. With Fashan's record in hand, Zawa Damdan added to that long tradition in post-Qing Haha by claiming Khotan as a Mongol city-state which in turn allowed him to make Mongol claims on the Yarlung court of Sangsung Gampo uh, and company. So Khotan, as many of you know, is just uh, on the uh, lower side of the Taklamahan Desert there, an important Buddhist city-state along the Silk Road. Um, okay. The centrality of Khotan, or Liul, in Zawa Damdan's historical imagination um, really cannot be overstated. Um, just as it had been for centuries amongst Tibetan and Mongolian monastic historians who debated, for example, whether Khotan, or whether the Khotan or the Liul described in the prophecy of the land of Li Sutra, the Liul uh, Lungtempa, uh, uh, and the Ox uh, Mountain Prophecy tr Sutra, and so on, had been located in Nepal or to the north, north of Tibet and China. And here's just a, an example of how this plays out uh, in the Golden Book. Uh, I won't read all of this uh, at all, but um, uh, he, he's basically making the argument that Buddhism had, uh, by the time the Buddhism's teaching uh, was beginning to hit Tibet, uh, it had already come to this Mongol world, this Horsok world, and in the third paragraph, the Chinese monk Fashan made his pilgrimage to India 300 years before the time of King Song Gampo. Then at the time of Song Gampo, Xuanzang went to India. On the way to India, they both saw that the victor's teachings had already been established in Hor, or Mongolia. And this is also shown from the fact that the great Sandalwood Zhou statue had come from uh, India to China via Hor. Uh, if you look at Hor, Mongolia, and these sources, there's no doubt that Buddhism was established there before China and Tibet. And this position is elaborated upon in the Golden Book by reinterpreting the legends uh, about the very first Tibetan king to have made contact with the Dharma, Totori Nyensen. Zawa Damdan rehearses the usual story that during his reign he received two foreign Buddhists from Khotan at his court. Realizing that their visit was in vain because the Tibetan course, court was then illiterate and they could not understand each other's language, they returned to their ho homeland, but not without leaving some holy objects behind which were um, stored and made into the first kind of uh, uh, Buddhist offering objects um, you know, in Tibet. And here too in Zawa Damdan's account, these were Mongols who had brought Dharma to the Tibetans. But that's not all. This claim is buttressed by turning to the legendary stories about Buddhist texts said to have miraculously fallen on the palace roof uh, 
uh, at another time, oops, uh, said to have miraculously fallen on the palace roof uh, at another time during Tatori Nensen's reign. The Golden Book, quote unquote, clarifies that while these have often been seen as descending from the sky, this is merely due to the fact that Tibetan Bumpo priests worship the sky and so made a faulty attribution. In fact, we read, these texts arrived on the still non-Buddhist Tibetan court, uh, to, to the still non-Buddhist Tibetan court, carried on a wind from the palace of the king of Zahor, which refers somewhere uh, to somewhere in Bengal, but in Zawa Damdan's telling, kind of buttressed by Fashan's account, this is from Mongolia. The same sort of a claim happens to King Songsan Gampo, another of the great Buddhist kings of the Yarlung Empire memorialized in Tibetan sources. Sansan Gampo brought not only Buddhism, but also literacy, architecture, medicine, and all other sorts of civilizing um, uh, influences to Tibet from their neighboring regions, according to the usual legends. The Golden Book reminds us that from Persia and the land of Sok in the west, Sansan Gampo brought the treasure of wealth. And from the northern lands of the Uyghur and Hor, he received the example of law, uh, end quote. And we're reminded that from among the six inner ministers whom he commanded, one was a whore or Mongol person. Um, how am I doing for time? Maybe I should slow down with the examples. But Okay, there's just one more, so let me, I'll get through it. Another example concerns the story of two other monks from Khotan who had a vision that the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara had manif manifested as a Dharma king in Tibet. Um, upon their arrival in the land of snows, they were first shocked to see executed criminal, criminals and other evidence of an apparently unenlightened kingship everywhere. Um, according to the usual story that many of you are already familiar with, these misconceptions were cleared um, upon meeting Sangsangampo, who awed them by revealing a seated Buddha Amitabha under his turban before magically sending them back to Khotan in an instant. Once more, from his vantage in the ruins of the Qing, Zawa Damdim mongolizes the classic legend, legend of Buddhism's uh, arrival into Khotan, Tibet, China, and their neighbors. Um, and fi very finally, this pattern is repeated in the well-worn story of the last great Dharma king of imperial Tibet, Trisong Detson, who, according to uh, popular lore, invited the great Indian abbot Shantarakshita and, of, and Padmasambhava, the great uh, tantric master, to transmit the monastic code and tantric lineages into Tibet and build the first monastery of Samye. Uh, in several of his histories, Zawa Damdin uses uh, new narratives such as those that he drew from Fashan's record um, to, tell, to make them tell a story about Mongolia. We read that um, Padmasambhava, uh, we read, for example, about Padmasambhava luring Pehar Gyalpo the uh, uh, protector of Sami, from a monastery in Batahor, which becomes a Mongolian place in this telling to become the founding protective deity of the Dharma in Tibet. Zawa Damdin similarly turns to two important figures in, uh, in Padmasambhava and King Trisong Densen's retinue, um, both of whom, we're told, apparently had Mongol bones, or Sog, uh, Sogru Chen. The abundance of Mongol actors in the, in the early Buddhist scene of imperial Tibet, writes Zawa Damdin, brought Mongol religious terminologies into the Tibetan lexicon, though this was soon erased by the reforms of the last of those great Tibetan Dharma kings, uh, Tri Rel Pelchen. Okay, so Zawa Damdan was, like Banzarov, later celebrated for being a harbinger of modern scholarship um, and uh, someone who opened the way for the reign of rationalism in revolutionary inner Asia, especially in Mongolia. In actual fact, his synthesis of Fashian's record was central to a very new interpretation of social and religious imagination amongst Buddhist scholastics in the ruin of the Qing, something that I explore uh, in much more detail in a recently completed book manuscript. This new social imaginary exceeded, ruptured, and confronted the newly invented Mongolian national subject and its histories, territories, communities, and sovereignties. Like much of Zawa Damdin's prolific intellectual work in the post-Qing era, his Fasyan translation formed at the intersection of mon monastic literary heritage and newly arriving academic discourses from Europe. Between the social sites of a newly formed scientific academy in Inner Asia and the monastic Datsang, or the monastic college. And importantly, between the social persona of a Buddhist monk and that of a scholar. <laughs> 
And this research is part of a broader project aimed at understanding the form and content of social and religious imagina imagination amongst such Buddhist monastics. Um, um, what were, I ask, the representations of history, territory, and sovereignty and religiosity um, of such monastics who were united by sharing monastic uh, um, interpretive positions in these dispersed monastic colleges, but who were newly divided between Soviet and Chinese and Republican Mongolian um, administration, uh, national kind of subjects. Um, and in this, I've been most interested in finding traces of the political and religious legacies of the Qing beyond its politi political endings topographies of the social and religious imagina imagination that confronted and exceeded the newly invented Mongolian national subject, right? Um, the results of these, these, these circuits, of which Fashian's text and his translations is just one example, um, were very new representations of time and territory that were really neither of the Qing nor the nation, uh, were neither of the academy nor the monastic archive, and yet remain very critical to understanding the complex forms of Mongolian Buddhism in the 20th century. So thank you very much.